Hey everyone, Wolf Lord Row here. Today we are reviewing the Siege of Terror novel, Fury of Magnus. As always, we will start off with a spoiler free review and score before we move on to me giving my opinion on certain spoilers in the story. And man, do we have some spoiler talk today. Now, as always, we will begin with me reading the synopsis off the back of the novel to give a little bit of a story summary. So, with that said, let's just jump straight in. Of all the Emperor's sons who fell to chaos, it is perhaps Magnus the Red whose tale is the most tragic. Sanctioned because of his desire for knowledge, chastised, judged, and shattered to his very elements, there is much for the Crimson King to feel vengeful for. Yet revenge is not the only thing that draws him to terror, alongside the War Master's besieging armies. He seeks something, a fragment, the missing piece of himself that lies within the most impregnable place on the planet. The inner sanctum of the Imperial Palace. As the greatest conflict of the ages reaches fever pitch, Magnus fights his own inner battle. To be whole once more, he must not only overcome the fiercest of defences, but also face the one being whom he loves and hates with equal fervour, more than any other, his errant father, the Emperor of Mankind. Okay, so the first thing I'll say is to truly appreciate this novel, you really do have to have read A Thousand Sons. Honestly, you can more or less get away with not having read Crimson King, but to understand Magnus, you should definitely read A Thousand Sons first. The whole premise and basis for everything Magnus becomes is really laid down in that novel. And I'm really pleased Graham McNeil got to end Magnus's journey, because he absolutely smashed it out of the park. Let's just get that out of the way straight away. As Graham McNeil began Magnus's journey with one of the most, if not the most, impactful novels in the entire Heresy series, he ends it with the best novel in the Siege of Terror series so far. At least in my opinion. Yes, it's far shorter than the main installments, but that really helps it focus on the stories you care about and there's not a lot of time wasted on side stories that aren't relevant to the main one. Now, the whole premise of this story is Magnus wanting to break into the Imperial Palace and retrieve his final soul shard, the part of him that he refers to as the best of him. And I'll be honest, I was reading this half thinking I'd forgotten about one of the shards, or perhaps there was a retcon that I hadn't noticed. But no, I wasn't going crazy. Magnus is indeed too late. And that's not a spoiler because we've already seen earlier in the Heresy series, Malkador used this shard to create Yanis or Janus, however you wish to say it, the first Grey Knight Supreme Master. Only Magnus the Red doesn't know that. Now, the Magnus we see here is very much the Graham McNeil Magnus that was created back in A Thousand Sons, in that he is still very clearly a conflicted man at his very core. And especially with the Magnus that Graham writes, his famed arrogance is a more subtle part of his nature, much more so than the stereotypical vocalness that others have portrayed Magnus with. And this is really the best Magnus to read. You once again find yourself doubting the Cyclops' punishment, and even wishing that somehow he can still, even now, be redeemed. And really, I think in that sense, the novel would have probably been more aptly named as the fate of Magnus, rather than the fury. Along for the ride, we have Magnus's closest sons, such as Ariman, 
But don't expect any major revelations for them as they are pretty much just along for the ride. And that's the way it should be. Now as for side stories, yes they are present and without getting into spoilers, you get to see what the salamanders who accompanied Vulcan to Terra are up to in the war upon the surface. And while yes there is a part of you that just wants to get back to Magnus, Graham McNeil writes these characters in such a way that you don't feel shortchanged in their parts of the story, even coming to enjoy them just as much as the main event itself. All in all for me, this is easily the best entry into the Siege of Terror series thus far, and truly a great culmination to Magnus's story. Even if you are not a fan of Magnus the Red, this story will make you hope, it will make you despair, it will excite you and even shock you. The author has crafted a story that, as it neared its end, I was on absolute tenderhooks, with goosebumps racing up my arms in anticipation. This novel is nothing short of 5 out of 5 blessed by the Emperor. You absolutely must read it. Now with that said, let's move on to the real spoiler talk. And again, for those that haven't read it, do yourself a favour and go read it first. Honestly, it's a story so good you do not want to go into it having read spoilers beforehand. You really don't. And aside from that, even listening to me talk now about events won't really make sense if you haven't read the novel. So do yourself a favour and read it first. Okay guys, so this isn't going to be an upload where we dive in and really interpret and analyse specific moments and motivations. That will of course be left for those uploads where we truly deep dive into those moments and really analyse the characters and their meaning. But I've got to tell you, I am now yearning to do a Magnus the Red Week. I really am. I was leaning towards maybe a Mortarian or Vulcan if the channel can hit 80k. But now, oh man, now, how on earth can it not be a Magnus the Red Week? We could spend a whole week talking about the throne room scene itself. But back to today, oh man, what a journey. It's the small details and revelations we saw here that really pushed this novel over the top for me. The fact that the visions of the future can indeed be proven wrong, with Magnus fuming over the Khan holding Colossi, and then the 20 villas beneath the palace around the subterranean lake, proving once and for all conclusively that the Emperor did intend for the Primarchs to be raised on terror. Man, you know me, I just can't help but love seeing things like this. But of course the main event and Magnus and his sons sneaking into the palace under the guise of blood angels. I'll be honest, that seemed a little bit of a stretch for me. That in the middle of the most defended place in the entire galaxy, on full alert no less, they could simply walk through using their powers to disguise themselves. It was a bit of a stretch. Until that is when we find out it was all allowed by the Emperor the whole time. Now during Magnus's journey deeper into the palace, we see Magnus reflecting on the memories from the past, moments with his father upon Terra. And this was a great simple way of showing us Magnus is not lost. As much as he tried to play it off as being proximity to the Shard, the truth is, it was him. Confirmed by the fact we know, the Shard is no more. So when that battle raging above caused the ceiling of the observatory to collapse, and Magnus used his power to save the lives of the refugees, even forsaking his disguise, it really is essentially showing us he is not lost to the ruinous powers. 
and that's the very proposal the Emperor gives to his son. With Malkador alone, and maybe Vulcan, trusted with the details. Now, Malkador is an intriguing part of the story for me. Having him meet Magnus upon the shores of the lake, surrounded by the 20 villas Magnus and his brothers were meant to be raised in, was such a great scene. And I wondered a lot just what part to play Olivia had in the whole scenario. Just why Malkador had recruited her back to his service and why she alone was accompanying him. And I'll definitely have to read it a few more times before I can truly decide. But right now, I certainly don't think it was to play Magnus at Regicide. I think it was to be that failsafe. If something did go wrong, and Magnus did kill Malkador, which of course he did, and oh man my mind when I read that part, I honestly thought we were seeing a major retcon in the works. And while history showed it was Malkador the hero upon the Golden Throne, that maybe, just maybe, it was going to be Magnus. How that was going to work out, I didn't know. But I'll admit, it had me. The story really had me. But it wasn't to be, and Malkador lives. Now, I'm no expert on the Perpetuals, I admit, but it certainly appears that Olivia gave her life to bring back Malkador. Now, why he couldn't simply come back as a Perpetual himself, I don't know, but it is certainly played up throughout the story that he appears weaker than he ever has, and that he is reaching his end. So maybe it's just his time. Like I said, I don't know, I'm going to read it a few more times before we truly dive in deep. There of course remains the possibility it was all part of the Emperor's plan. Though it's clear his tears are raw and real when he comes to Olivia. And I'm assuming this was to ask her to give her life in exchange for Malkador's himself. Again, as ever, we are left to our own interpretations. Now as for that fateful final encounter, when the Emperor brings Magnus into the throne room and he offers him a chance at forgiveness. Man the feels, this story was just packed with them one after another. The Emperor knowing Magnus was not yet given to the ruinous powers, offers Magnus the chance to rejoin his brothers and take his place by his side. I wondered how they would get around it, how McNeil would make it not work out, and the reason was his legion could not come back too, that the Thousand Sons could not be redeemed. Now, I'll be honest, the reason wasn't the best for me, but honestly, I don't know what else could have been used for Magnus to say no as it's clear he never wanted to betray his father in the first place. So making it a choice to save his sons at least keeps Magnus' fall the truly tragic tale it always was. Of course, I love the appearance of Vulcan, the one lone son kept by his father's side. And most importantly, the only other outside Malkador that must have known the Emperor's plan, at least to some extent. That's some measure of trust from the Emperor in the Lord of Drakes. And it was fantastic to see him in action amongst the throne room. That final, last line of defence against any opposition. Vulcan standing between the Emperor and Magnus. The final fight between the brothers, though epic, I thought was a little one-sided in favour of Magnus. But it was his story, so you really can't complain. And Vulcan technically does get the win, though it is due to the interference of his sons. Before Magnus finally condemns himself to an eternity of slavery at the hands of the ruinous powers. Man, it was such a roller coaster of a ride. 
and the throne room scene alone will be amazing to break down and analyse. Honestly, I could do that for a week alone, let alone Magnus. There is just so much meaning to unravel. But as always guys, what do you think? What did you think of Magnus's final turn to the side of the ruinous powers? And what of the Emperor's offer? Was the cost of the Thousand Sons too much for Magnus to give? Or knowing his sons were truly condemned, should he have accepted his father's offer? What did you make of their final confrontation? And do you want to see Magnus the Red in the next Primarch week, should we get there? As always, leave your thoughts in the comments below, I love to read them. Huge thank you to all my subscribers, your support truly means a lot to me, it really does. And if you're new, please consider subscribing to help the channel grow. And if you enjoyed this particular vid, then why not drop a like on it too. But with that said, I am off and I'll see you all again real soon.